Hi, I'm DJ Ware, and welcome to the, Giz the Cyber Gizmo. Today, we're going to continue the discussion of the future of computing. And one of the things we're going to look at is, uh, is to look at kind of the trend that's been going on in the industry for about the last two years. Uh, and that is to continue to add cores to the processors and uh, and to uh, sell them with uh, additional performance. So the question is, if I uh, replace my quad-core CPU with an eight-core, uh, my machine will be twice as fast, right? If the clock speeds are the same. Well, maybe, uh, but probably not likely. And so what we're gonna explore today is some of the reasons why that will be. Uh, in the 1960s, I think around 67, 68, uh, Gene Amdahl looked at uh, multiprocessing and parallel processing and came up with this uh, graph, which describes that, uh, that doubling the number of processors only doubles the performance if you get 100% parallelization out of your code. Uh, as you can see, as you move across the right, the number of cores, uh, or number of processors, you hit a certain uh, amount of, of perfect speed up. And so he kind of bracketed this off into if the code didn't have any serial portions in it or, uh, uh, or you know, single threaded types of uh, components, then you would increase up to a cap of 20 times the performance. Now, um, that cap seems to be holding true today, but we'll we'll take a look more at that in a minute. So um, let's uh, let's look at the formula first, and for our purposes today, we're going to use a very simple one, and that's to calculate the percent speed up, which is based on the number of cores in the uh, CPU in the in the in the CPU, also the percentage of the applications which is which is single threaded. And then we'll look at uh, the optimization or the improvement estimate that we might uh, anticipate uh, with this, and then we'll calculate a speed up from that. So I'm going to look at the uh, Byte benchmark or the Unix benchmark that was first published in the mid '80s. It had a number of iterations to add multi-core support. As uh, I mean, multi-core support's been around a long time, particularly in the RISC processors. Uh, they added multi-cores pretty early on, even before Intel did. And, uh, and so the reason I chose the, uh, the the byte benchmark is for two reasons. One, its its variant of multi-processing uses the Unix fork which creates a copy of the application and then starts it up with a, a set of data that's different from the other one that's running. It's, it's more efficient than threading, but it's heavier weight because you're, you're pushing an entire copy of the application to execute. So uh, <clears throat> based on the number of cores of eight, well, that will be our N value. And uh, we know from the literature that uh, uh, the byte benchmark is about 14%. 13, 14 percent uh, serial code, and so we're going to be really optimistic and expect a 100 percent improvement uh, if we can, uh, if in the uh, serial particular the serial portions of the code due to uh, uh, multi-core. So uh, the, we'll come up with something about a 413 percent single core to uh, eight core uh, improvement. So to do that, we're going to measure it, of course. And we're going to use the uh, Unix benchmark, the Unix benchmark version 5.13, which was written in uh, updated in 2011. And also, we're going to look at the Sysbench, which uh, it's a it's a popular one to use on YouTube, and uh, have seen a number of people use it to compare uh, different machines uh, to, uh, from one to another. Which that's that's a good use of it. And so we'll look at both of those and see what we we come up with. So the first thing we're going to look at is the byte benchmark, and it it does a number of things. Like uh, it calculates uh, integer uh, math or primes, and uh, uses the dry stone benchmark to do that. It also looks at whetstone, which is double precision or floating point. It uh, it adds a Excel spreadsheet component, has a number of uh, file copy uh, mechanisms to measure that. It also looks at uh, pipeline throughput, or and this is pipes that are in uh, Unix. So this would be the pipes that use IPC uh, uh, kind of memory. And uh, it'll look at the context switching when you're moving, uh, you're switching the execution from one of those uh, applications in the pipe to another. It looks at 
process creation, how long it takes to spin up a new app, and then uh, how well sh different shell scripts uh, perform under this model with uh, multi-core, with one concurrent and eight concurrent. And then it looks at the, the system call, call overhead, which is uh, always in, in use when you're doing file I.O. or fetching memory or, or storing memory and so forth. So uh, what we ended up with, with uh, uh, four core, and I turned hyper threading off to measure the, the uh, uh, four core result, which would be the, the normal number of cores in a 6700K, and uh, came up with a speed up of about three, 283%. Uh, and the formula calculates out to be about 284%, so pretty close to what we expected. Uh, so not a big surprise there. And when I moved to A-Core, this is turning hyper-threading back on. Uh, the, we, the calculation from Amdahl's law said about 411%, and we saw about a 457%. So we did better in some areas, and uh, I suspect that might be uh, in the, uh, if you look at the really big jump, was in process creation. So it was uh, optimizations in the fork process in uh, Linux in the in the five oh, the five O kernel. I suspect are probably coming into play there, although not sure. But there's obviously something in the architecture that is definitely pushing process creation uh, efficiency up. Uh, in the Sys benchmark, the one I was really the most interested in was the, the CPU, the number of events per second on a single versus four versus eight. And we saw about a 505% increase in, uh, in uh, performance on the eight core versus the single and about a 301% uh, going from four core to uh, going to four core. So eh, not bad, but the eight core is a little disappointing. We didn't quite reach as high as we would have expected. But, um, the Amdahl's law calculation uh, projected uh, 193 for the 8 core and we got 217, so we did better. And it projected 171% for the 4 core and we only got 129. Uh, and of course, Sysbench uses the threaded model, not the process model. So that could be the inefficiencies in the thread model that was, is used in that, in that particular uh, software code because you'll notice particularly when it's doing memory uh, uh, transfer, that it, it is not very fast with the uh, four core. So it, it does speed up quite a bit when you uh, introduce uh, hyper-threading. So what did we learn from this? Uh, we got about 283% on four and 457% on eight. Uh, we saw some really good gains in the whetstone, the pipeline context switching, and the process creation was spectacular. Uh, file operations, of course, didn't benefit because in this on this particular machine, I don't have multiple drives uh, handling the I/O load. I don't have a RAID set up. It's just a, a simple SSD. So I didn't expect file operations to contribute to the overall parallelism of the system. Uh, in the Sys benchmark, uh, I did not run one of the uh, several of the tests. Mutex being one of them. And Mutex doesn't seem to be operating correctly. It, what it should do in multiprocessing is it should it should spread the load between the machines with different data. But it looks like it, it to me it looks like it is loading the same copy of the data to all cores, and running a complete benchmark on either, on all the cores. And so there wasn't any increase in performance. Um, CPU test, of course, was the best. Uh, and apparently it has a lot more serial code in that benchmark than the byte benchmark and don't know exactly how much but uh, a back calculation shows about 45% of the Sysbench's uh, serial code. Don't have any other comment about it other than that. Uh, one thing I will say is that I did not run the uh, PTS uh, benchmarks and the reason for that, I tried to do it, and it looks like they're really set up more to do comparisons between machines versus doing comparisons on the same machines with different cores. So uh, I'll look into that in the future and maybe try to do an update uh, on using those benchmarks. They are a little bit better. And of course, I didn't use the uh, spec in it. Uh, benchmarks, those of course, cost a lot of money, and uh, I don't have them. So. Uh, uh, did not look at the, the spec init benchmarks or the spec CPU benchmarks either for that matter. So some of the things that have, that have occurred since Amdahl's time was uh, the introduction of uh, pipelines into the mainstream CPUs. And in the original uh, manufacture of the Intel chipsets, it took four cycles to complete in a single instruction. You, you, each one of those, each instruct, an instruction takes a fetch, a decode, an execute, and a write in order to complete. And so each of those takes a cycle of the CPU to, to do. 
Uh, and I've got a simple example using uh, four. This is certainly not true of how the architecture today works under Intel, but it's just a simple example to explain the difference between a, a single instruct uh, CPU and one that's in using pipeline. So the difference is you still have four cycles to complete an instruction, but you anticipate the flow of the code and that you take the second, third, and fourth, for example, and you start the fetch on each of those after the fetch on the previous instruction has completed. And so even though you don't increase the time it takes to do a single instruction, you do increase the throughput on, and the ability of the system to, to do work in parallel, which is a good thing. Uh, graphics pipelines uh, have been around for, uh, for a while and they have been improved uh, all throughout that time. They first appeared on uh, large uh, supercomputers in the 1980s and they appeared first on the PC in the 1990s. Uh, there have been a number of iterations and a number of changes that have made it very complex. I looked at some of the diagrams that it's just had, it just makes your head spin on what they're doing, but essentially it's similar uh, where they're uh, pipelining various operations in order to gain parallelization through the GPU. Uh, in software pipelines, those first appeared in 1973, and what we're talking about here are the ones that uh, use IPC so that the applications can share the same data in memory or not, um, and, uh, and you gain parallelization because they can each operate on separate parts of the data set. HTT pipelines uh, were introduced about two decades ago, and those allow for multiple requests to be uh, uh, in process without waiting for each one to respond. So um, in that case, uh, that's more of an asynchronous view of pipelining, and we'll look at that more in a future, uh, in a future video. So just to recap some things to learn about pipelines, they do not decrease the time to process a single, a single unit of data they increase the throughput of the system. The other problem is, is that as you push down deeper, say I went from uh, a CPU that did four pipelines to eight to 16, then each of those uh, deeper pipelines build latency. And so uh, the time to propagate through the stages takes more from the time you start to the time you finish. Also, pipelines can stall. You're doing anticipatory execution of the uh, program logic and so if there's a conditional branch or an unconditional branch or you miss a data cache, then the pipeline has to wait for those things to complete before it can continue, and that spoils your parallelism. If an application in the side of Unix IPC aborts, then the whole pipeline shuts down and you're basically broken. The data drops off into the bit bucket and you got to go off and fix your problem and rerun the job again. So a few concluding thoughts. I think Amdahl's law is still relevant, and there is some there is a tremendous impact to the parallel performance of the code simply uh, in the injection of serial code. Just a small amount can really impact the performance negatively. Uh, as far as uh, uh, system bottlenecks, you got to go deal with those yourself. I mean, and, and, and as you do, you're chasing you're chasing down a trail to eliminate all of them, which would be an impossibility. But if you're trying to minimize them, you're going to overcome one, and then something else is going to become the blocker, and you got to go deal with that. Uh, so that's a pretty painstaking process, and you also need to go in and, and ma manage the data so that you're cutting it up efficiently, you're distributing it out to the processors efficiently so that they're all executing and ending in the execution at about the same time so that they can then grab the next uh, uh, amount of data and continue working. There's no standard ways to do this. Uh, it's all in the code. Uh, it's all in your application. The operating systems don't help you. The compilers don't provide any help either. So it's all it's all up to you. And there's there's no way to change it dynamically. You, uh, you you can't just go in and change a configuration setting and say, oh, I want more parallelism in this code. There's no way to do that. You've got to go manage it yourself. So I think uh, I'll wrap it up with a, with a few quotes that uh, I, I, I really like. And the first one is, you can spend a lifetime getting 95% of your code in parallel and never achieve the 20, the 20 times speed up, no matter how many processors you throw at it. And that's quite true, and that has been true for over the uh, past many, many decades. You, 
when when high performance computing or supercomputing first started, the way they they gained throughput was they increased the word size, so they didn't have to deal with parallelism because all they did was they just gave it more and more data to work on it at, at a single throw. Well, eventually they reached the point of, of diminishing returns with that. And so parallelism became the thing to do, and there was no tools to do it. So, and and there was no standard way of doing parallelism. If if the facility brought in a CDC box, and then the next year they brought in a uh, a sequent or a, a, a cube or one of those machines, then the architecture that you had in your application had to be thrown out and rewritten in order to take advantage of it. And that prompted George Michael, uh, formerly of Lawrence Livermore, to say this, and that is, manufacturers want us to warp our algorithms to fit their computer, but what we need is for the computer to warp itself to our algorithms. And he's quite right about that. The, the, if, if uh, as you bring in these faster and faster machines, the honest is on the application developer, not on the system developer, and it's really their job. I think, in order to man maximize the performance of the machines because it's too expensive to change applications. It's too expensive to do conversions. A lot of this code uh, took decades and decades to write. And of course, a lot of it's decades and decades old as well. And so to adapt it to a new architecture takes a lot of time. And, and probably the, the original person that wrote it isn't alive anymore. So the effort, uh, and then Gene Amdahl's quote, the effort expended on achieving high parallel processing rates is wasted unless it's accompanied by achievements of sequential processing rates of very nearly the same magnitude, which means that everything, I mean, everything is a balance, right? You got to keep everything in balance. You got to minimize the amount of serial code so that the, you could gain more parallelism in the process. And again, that's on you. So I think, uh, I, th I think uh, I think the main thing to, to take away here is that there needs to be some major changes in the way the operating systems work. We have seen some uh, some movement in that direction recently uh, from Microsoft in order to take advantage of AMD's uh, 16 uh, processor cores. And also we've seen some movement in the Linux uh, community to make things more efficient for parallel processing. But we still don't have the tools in the compiler fields in order to be able to, to optimize the code for parallel execution. And, and all of that, I mean, it's a good step. It's, it's the right direction, but we need more tools and we need better tools. And so with that, I'm going to bid you a farewell and I thank you for watching. If you found this informative, please like and subscribe below. And I'll see you again next time. Bye for now.